Hello Internet, my name is Guy, and this is the tenth clock that I've made in collaboration with my friend Dave Bruckenstein. He lives in North Carolina and I'm here in Maine. We've never met, but we've managed to design and create ten amazing art clocks over the last several years. This video obviously is about the making of this clock. Uh, he and I designed the clocks together, and this one is actually an evolution of the two previous clocks that used this display strategy here of showing time in dots. We'll get to the details of that in a moment. Um, the design of this clock actually evolved physically from uh, a series of different ideas. The first idea was basically a pole. Uh, it looked a little bit too much like a coat rack. But we started with that point of reference, and then we kept evolving the idea and evolving the idea. And every time we came up with a new idea, or Dave did, he would do a CAD rendering. That's his specialty. Um, so we don't really lock eyes on something until he's done a complete CAD rendering, so we both understand where he's coming from. So in this design evolution, suddenly one of us, I think it was Dave, thought, well, what about some kind of plank? that we could put the lights in. And uh, we kept developing that, and it was a solid board, and then it was a board with holes, and then it was a board with a center post in the middle, which is kind of where we ended up here. So this is how this clock works. It's similar to the previous two, with the one change where you see this dot fading up and down and going to the next one and going to the next one, and it cycles around and comes back over here. So it's constantly fading up and chasing up like this. But then if you reach over and touch the touch plate, now it's going to show the time in hours. So it's four, and then in five minute increments, five, 10, 15, 20. So it's 4.20 p.m. Simple. Uh, the previous clocks used this same technology, and so we had a leftover circuit board. I actually designed a circuit board specifically for those earlier clocks. Um, the first of these, those clocks was made from aluminum, and then Dave liked that first one so much that he wanted to make three for his adult kids, and so we made them out of cherry and maple and walnut. Those were very successful. He, his kids loved them, and we, we fell in love with this idea of using dots. This is going to be a kind of a long video. I'd love for you to stay with it all the way through because if you're a maker and you work with wood, aluminum, plastic, electronics, you'll find some tips hidden away in here somewhere. I think you'll enjoy watching it. I picked up these beautiful S4S boards from the local big box hardware store. They're maple, which is what we had decided to use on this clock. And S4S stands for surfaced four sides or sanded four sides, which means they're pristine. They're almost completely perfectly finished. I, all I have to do is put some finish on them. Uh, the clock design from Dave, uh, and he does these wonderful CAD renderings, uh, specified that the boards be three inches wide, and what I got was three and a half inches wide. So I'm going to have to rip them down and, of course, cut them to length. And one of the things I do here is I look at each board and decide which parts and which features of each board to use where in the clock. This particular board here has a section of dark uh, grain pattern that goes from here to here. And I'm thinking about putting that just below where the dots are in the clock to, to make that a part of the feature of the center part of the clock. And the rest of the boards are less important. There's going to be two horizontal cross pieces about 15 inches long. Uh, they can be very bland plain wood. So I'm going to select these areas mark them out and make my first what I call commitment cut. So here goes, commitment cut. I'm going to get this board set up on the chop saw right at my mark and cut number one. Now before I make each cut, I'm going to check each side and feel for unevennesses or rough edges and decide which side to cut off. So I'm going to turn on my dust collector and start cutting. So here's our top two pieces, and this is the center piece that will go in the center of the clock where the display will be. I've got the LED strip that will get buried down inside of the wood here, and I'm just making sure I've got all my marks roughly in place. I've determined that the spacing between the LEDs here is 0.655 inches, 
So I can put that into the DRO of my mill and get, get those spacings exactly right. So now I have the wood clamped into my milling machine and a half inch Forstner bit in the machine. I'm setting a depth for how go deep to go to make these holes and then I'm going to lock off the column stop so that it won't go too deep. Raise it back up again, checking that height and moving over to the center line, which I had calibrated. Now I'm locking off the x-axis there. Ready to drill a hole now, just checking my lineup. Starting the machine and drilling that very first hole. Perfect. So now I'm just going to increment over to the next position, looking at my DRO display, which is off to the left of the screen. You can't see it, but I can see the numbers showing up, and I know exactly where to go to within a thousandth of an inch. So now I'm moving through all the different holes and incrementing along uh, using the DRO to find my positions and drill each hole exactly in the right place, working our way down. I know it's weird to be using a milling machine on wood, and there are certain YouTubers who are probably giggling right now, but this is the best way for me to do it. So now I'm taking the Forstner bit out of the mill, and I'm going to replace it with the half-inch router bit. That's a very long yellow router bit. It's normally used, of course, in woodworking and not machining, but again, I'm faking it with woodworking on a metal machine. just wanted to show you the clever jig I had to use to mount the wood high enough to clear my y-axis motor speed control here. I've already made the first pass and now I'm just opening it up a little bit wider to make it wide enough to hold the LED strip that will push in to this slot here and then light the little dots from behind. So here's a quick test fit of the LEDs. Looks like it's dropping in perfectly. I have a half inch plug cutter in the drill press here and I'm going to pop out a plug which will end up looking like this that will get inserted into the wood. So I'm going to clamp this down right about there, fire up the drill press, and go in very gently here so I don't overheat the acrylic. There we go. Now I should be able to pop that out. There it is. There we are. When I cut the plugs with this plug cutter, the cutter itself has a very slight taper like this. So that when I flip this over now, it will be the wide side up and it will then plunge down in here and wedge its way in when I use this strong clamp to clamp it into place. So I'm going to get one of these the right way up, put it in the hole, force it in a little bit. Oh, yeah, you see that's not seating very well, but it will when I force it with this high pressure clamp here. So I'm going to set this up just right, right here, and then wind this down and force it in. I have to keep repositioning it to make sure it goes in just right. Did you hear a little crack there? I think that was wood moving slightly. Hope that wasn't the plastic. Nope. There we go. So now that's nice and completely flush. I'm going to continue doing the rest of these. Obviously there will be this LED light strip hidden beneath here where the lights will shine up. I don't know whether you heard the cracking sound when I tried to push these into the wood, um, but I did and it cracked the wood very slightly. It split it very slightly. So the plug is cutting these a bit too big and what I'm going to do now is just sand them down a little bit. So I'm going to sit here and just gently nudge them down like this a little bit at a time until they fit. I'm not sure if you can see the cracks here. It almost looked like a pencil line, but they're there. Uh, but now with the slightly sanded down discs, I can just about push them in by hand, which I'm going to do, and then tighten them in with the clamp. So then I can use the clamp to bring them in flush. Oops, like that. Well, it's an ominous sound, but I'm going to take a chance here and see if this all will work out. 
So now that I have them all in there, I'm going to fill this little crack right in here with my favorite good fella, wood filler. Crack some of that open here. It's nice and gooey, and I've used it a lot on maple over the last few years, and it's really good stuff. So I'm just going to gum that right down in there, fill it all up. And I had planned originally to sand all of these down to this, the smooth surface here, so this was part of the original plan. Okay, now some 220 grit sandpaper. Okay, that's a nice smooth finish. These discs just disappear right into the wood surface. And of course, this uh, section right here is where the um, stainless steel touch plate will go, so I'm gonna embed that later. On the back, I'm going to need to cut a recess all the way down the whole uh, back of the center post here to run the wires all the way down into the base. Um, so there's an electronic circuit that will be down in the base that will feed signals up to the dots. But also there's a little touch sensor circuit board that I'm going to make into a recess right in the back here. So first I'm going to cut this slot. So I have my dado cutter set here at about a 3 8 inch height. Uh, I just need to center it out to uh, right in the center of the board. Right there, inch and a half to the center. And then I'm going to take the board here and gently lower it on right about here. Make sure I'm not going to cut into the dots. Nope, that should be fine. So I'm going to start my dust collector here. Now I'm going to mark out and locate a place to put that little touch sensor board. Looking at the back near the top, the dots end just about here somewhere, and then the touch sensor starts here. But, and then I decided, why don't I just go ahead and put all of the controls up inside of here too. So this is the control circuit board that I designed for all the previous clocks that use a similar dot display system. This is a connector that will feed to the dots. But that means I have to open all of this up to make room for the buttons and the circuit board, and I'm going to do that on the mill using a big router bit. Yes, I know, woodworking on a mill. Okay, here we go. I'm going to start hogging out the wood right in here. I'll do multiple depth passes. I've got a piece of stainless steel mounted to the milling machine that I'm going to cut a half inch strip for the touch plate out of. So first thing I'm going to do is use my dial indicator to make sure it's true. So I'm going to run the table across and watch my dial indicator here. Make sure it's all dialed in perfectly. So far that needle isn't moving at all. Um, I did actually dial it in a little earlier. So I'm just double checking basically. I can see the needle wiggling very slightly, but we're within a half a thou, roughly. Yep, I'm gonna call that good. Okay, so this is gonna be a first cleanup pass to take off the factory edge on this piece of stainless steel. That's the first pass. All right, so I've got an eighth inch uh, milling cutter in there and I'm hoping to cut this off with a slot all the way down the length here. Let's see if this works. I'm using a lot of WD-40 to keep that bit cool. Very slow feed rate here, taking my time. Don't want to break a milling cutter. So to round over the end of the stainless steel touch plate, I'm just going to blue the end with this wonderful Sharpie. Use my half inch template here and very carefully draw the outline of a circle that I want here. 
and then I can grind that off. Okay, quick test fit to see how this fits in and looks pretty good to me. All I need to do is brush this surface to make it all shiny and it's finished. When I originally looked at the design uh, for the whole frame here, I thought, okay, it's logical to do a um, mortise and tenon joint here. So I'd make tenons in this surface and mortises on this surface. And uh, I did a quick test making a tenon on my milling machine and didn't like it. Just didn't, didn't feel like it worked for me. And then I remembered I have this wonderful dowel jig. So the dowels will then connect and I'm going to have two here and two here and two here. And then the question became, how the heck do I glue this up? Because it's longer than my workbench and I don't have a way to get clamps to clamp everything together. So I finally realized that if I put two dowels right here and then drill a screw all the way through, I can actually screw them together and maybe not even need glue, just dowels and a screw. So here's how this dowel jig works. Just drop it onto the wood tighten it down and use a half inch drill for these half inch dowels. And that's the first hole that will take one dowel right there. So slight change of plan. I've decided to go with two dowels on the center post here. So they will get glued in right here. And then I'm going to use these three inch screws. So I've drilled a uh, relief hole back here for the head so that the head can sink in and go in and bite in right into there. Same thing over here except one dowel and one screw on each side over here. So this will be right here. These will be glued in all across on this side. And then these screws will come in right there. I'm liking this. This is going to work out fine, I think. So Dave ordered a piece of white translucent acrylic called satin ice that will go on the back. It's a little bigger. Uh, he gave me a little extra room, and so I'm going to cut it down. I've already ripped off about an inch on this edge. I'll take off another inch and a half on this edge. Now I need to mark off holes all the way around the perimeter of this in order to screw it down. So I'm going to just use my tri-square here and make a line all the way around the edge as a reference line for where the holes will go. And then I'll mark off a bunch of equally spaced holes all the way around the sides. So now I'm going to drill all these holes all the way through the acrylic all the way around. Um, I'm going to use a special acrylic drilling bit. You notice the taper is a little different here. If you drill acrylic with a regular bit like this, when you drill it down, it jumps through and can break the acrylic. So what happens with this bit is it eases through very gently and completes the cut when you drill through into the wood here. This is substantially larger than the screw, so that will allow when the screw goes into this washer here, it will allow the acrylic to move around in there as the wood adjusts and uh, everything can adjust and correct. Okay, I've got a scrap block underneath of here so I can drill right in. I'm just going to hit each location and drill all the way through. So before I do final assembly, I have to take the protective paper off and I'm going to use this plastic finish that is a cleaner and anti-static compound. It's called Brillianize and it's a really great uh, stuff because it leaves the acrylic just feeling great too. So it's important to do both sides of this. Get it all cleaned up, ready for the final assembly. The reason this stuff I think is named satin ice because it has a satin texture, kind of a slight texture on each side but also it has this nice opacity so that you can actually sort of see through it, but not completely. So I'm just finishing up installing all of the wiring inside the central column here. This is the power wire that feeds all the way down the channel to the bottom. I'm just going to solder that into the motherboard.
Okay, so I've got the electronics all tucked in, and if you look carefully, you can see this LED is fading up and down very slightly. This is the touch sensor here, and the motherboard, and the hour and minute set buttons. If I flip it over, you can see that it's doing its default be behavior of fading up and down slowly and working its way up to the top here. So it'll fade down, or up and then down, and when it gets down, it'll go up to the next one. And then if you wave your hand near the touch sensor, it shows 1 o'clock and minutes. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35. That is the actual time. I hope you're enjoying watching this video. We're about halfway through or so. Uh, there's a lot more to come. If you're liking what you're seeing, please give me a like or a subscribe. And if you have some thoughts or comments you'd like to share, please comment below. Okay, here's final assembly. I've decided to forego glue and just screw them and dowel them together. Alright, let's put a screw in there. Good. And now the top end. Nicely seated there, put a screw in, so some of these edges and details are going to need some sanding and refining, not a big deal, some slight alignment issues here. It looks like all of these surfaces are going to need a little bit of aligning, maybe a little bit of wood putty. Get them all leveled out. I lost live audio here, but I'm just applying the Wipon polyurethane finish. This is the first of two or three coats that I've applied to make it look really nice. This wood finishes up really well. For a final finish, I'm going to use what I've always used on my furniture. And yes, I've made a lot of furniture over the years. Howard Feed and Wax. It's made from uh, beeswax and orange oil. It smells absolutely delicious when you use it, so there's kind of a reward to using it, I think. And it leaves just a really a nice luster on the wood. It just gives it a glow, and if you have furniture at home that's looking dull and tired looking, this stuff will bring it back to life. It's magic. I love this stuff. Getting close to final assembly here. So uh, the center column here, which is of course loose like this until it gets secured to the sheet of acrylic that will get screwed on here. First I have to pound it in onto the two dowels here. So I've got it lined up pretty good and then I'm going to of course put a screw in there. I've got a rubber mallet at this end with a sacrificial block and hopefully That looks like it tightened up real good. I was just getting set up to start drilling and screwing this down when I remembered that there are two holes I need to make here for the hour and minute set buttons. So I'm going to make a little X right there and another one right there and I'm going to drill those holes out so the buttons can come up flush to the sheet of acrylic. Okay, I've got my two holes drilled now. This whole process has been iterative uh, steps of checking and double checking and then planning and replanning and changing plan. That's just the name of the game with this type of work, I think. Um, but it's still working out in the long run. So um, I've set up a piece of tape on my drill so I know how deep to drill these holes. I'm going to start with one in the corner right here. Uh, 
Um, and I'm going to drill one opposite corner over here. That'll keep this stack down, and then I can start going crazy with holes. So I'm going to put those two screws in using the washers, and I'm going to tighten them down just gently. I'm going to hand tighten these eventually. So I have all the holes drilled. I'm just going to go around now and put all the screws in. Here's the last couple of screws. By the way, these are Stainless steel screws and washers. I have a preference for stainless steel because it always looks pretty when you're done. But it also stays pretty forever because it's stainless. So now I'm going to go through all of the screws here with a hand screwdriver and just check tightness. I'm going to back them off and just feel just to where they're not super duper snug. That'll allow things to move as the wood expands and contracts or the acrylic expands and contracts. Things can shift around underneath these large decorative countersunk washers. Having completed the clock, now it was a question of how we mount it to a base. This was a proposal that I had with a solid aluminum base with angle brackets to support it made out of wood. Dave didn't like that, so we then tried to simplify it down and realized that we can just put some steel posts in the back screwed into the base. So having decided on dimensions for the base, we knew that we needed something heavy, and I found this perfectly sized piece of three quarter inch thick aluminum plate, uh, about 18 inches by eight inches. So I'm gonna clean this up, finish it up, bevel it, sand it, and lacquer it, and then mount the two bolts in here that will stick straight up that the clock will then secure to, to give it rigidity so it won't flip around. So I'm gonna get onto my woodworking tools to work with aluminum, which again is a weird non sequitur, but you can do that. Okay, I'm gonna tidy up the edge on my table saw because that uh, rough edge of the factory cut was too, hard, too much to sand off. So I'm just gonna take a tiny, tiny piece off. I've already done the other side here. You can see some shavings. So now I'm going to bevel the edges here with my router. So I have a 45 degree bevel cutter in the router. I use a piece of test wood to check the bevel, make sure it's right. So firing up my dust collector and the router. Okay, now I've changed the router bit to a very small radius roundover bit. So I can just soften the bottom edge of the base plate and I'm just going to test it on a piece of wood first. Okay, now I'm going to sand all of the surfaces to a matte finish, starting with 150 grit on my orbital sander. And I'm using this downdraft table here that will remove some of the dust and also help stabilize the workpiece on this rubber mat. So I'm going to fire up my dust collector first and the sander. So you can see already, just with a light first pass, that it's creating a nice matte texture. So in order to do the edges off the side here, I've hooked my dust collector directly to the sander because this wasn't catching it. It was all going into the bag, which is not as efficient. So uh, I'm going to continue. So I've wiped off the surface with denatured alcohol to remove any oil or other residue from the surface. And then I've hit one layer of uh, shellac sprayed on. It leaves a beautiful, slightly matte texture, a slight stipple, and as you can see, um, you can see a little bit of the iridescence of the sanding marks, 
which really adds character and beauty, I think, to this chunk of aluminum, which weigh, weighs about 15 pounds. It's, uh, it's going to be really good grounding weight for this clock. I just picked up a piece of half-inch steel rod from the hardware store, so I'm going to drill holes in here, slightly undersized for the steel rod, and then I'm going to um, dial those down a little bit on the lathe to make sure they drop in and stop right there. Then I'm going to make a couple of mounts to go on the back of the clock so that the clock will slide down onto these rods that will stick up, oh, about 10 inches. So first step is to drill these holes. So I'm starting with a uh, centering drill. So now I'm going to start with a 3 8 inch drill and work my way up. Over to the metal lathe, I'm going to square off the end and then reduce it very slightly, 3 quarter of an inch deep, to drop into the base and that will fit the drill size that I just drilled, which is less than the, uh, the full diameter of the half-inch rod here. Here's the first test fit of my machined finish. It'll just drop right in there and perfectly fit. Just a little bit of wiggle there. Next one I'm going to make a bit tighter, I think. That's pretty good though. So I've been debating how to make a connection point between the support rods here and the clock, and this is representing the clock here. I was thinking about making them out of aluminum, and I've just made a prototype out of solid maple, the same material as the clock. So this would screw right into the clock and it will ride down onto these support poles, posts right here and screw right on, just like that. There's enough screw penetration into this maple wood that it'll really bite in there quite strongly. So I don't think I need to use um, aluminum here because this is compressing the cross grain of the wood and this is going to be very strong. So I'm going to make up four of these try clamping them on to the clock and everything and just see how it sets without even putting any screws in there. Just see how it feels. And if that works, then I'm going with wood. If not, I'll go with aluminum. I've got the blocks on the posts here and they're clamped to the clock and the clock is on the base and it's, uh, it's as stable as, as it's going to be, I think. So what I need to do now is notch out the acrylic here for these blocks and then these will get screwed on down here, these will get screwed on down here, and that will be the permanent fixture. So I decided to make a series of four stop collars to sit on top of the shafts so that when you pick the clock up, it won't lift out of the base.
Here I'm setting up my part lines before I do a final finish on all these exterior surface and then I'll be able to part these parts off completely. <laughs> So now I'm going to just finish the surface, make it look nice. So now I'm going to part off these four pieces that I've made. A little bit of lubrication. And a lower speed. Perfect. Thanks for staying with me throughout this whole video. Um, there's a change of plan that has happened here on how we mount the clock to the base. This is a 15 pound chunk of aluminum, so if these two were firmly connected to each other, picking it up would be a pain because it would be a massive pendulum uh, and this base would probably bump into your ankles and be very awkward to move. So from the beginning we were thinking, okay, why don't we just put um, these rods and glue those into the base and then mount all of this stuff so that you could then lower the clock onto these rods. Well, that didn't seem very safe or functional. You could probably end up breaking these wooden blocks here. Uh, we looked at ways to attach these blocks to the uh, clock here with glue and screws, and then I thought about capturing it and having a screw tighten to grip onto the rod. We didn't quite like that idea, so then we decided to use these wood blocks and then these stop collars so that when you pick the clock up, it can't lift off the rod and when you push it down, there's a collar down here uh, to make sure that you can push the rods down into the base. So my next step here is to use a transfer punch to optimize everything, get it all clamped together, line it up and then transfer punch the holes into the wood so I know where to pre-drill holes for these screws. And then I will screw and glue these blocks down and secure them thoroughly. So that's my next step. So I've notched out around the block and the collar here, had a little bit of an accident with a split right there. I think I overheated my uh, jigsaw cutter. So that doesn't protrude, I don't think, visibly into the edge here. So now I'm just going to take this clamp off and very carefully with my transfer punch, just tap it in place and identify the location for these two screw holes. And set the whole thing up and drill some screws in. I've got my drill bit set up with a piece of tape to the depth that the screw will penetrate into the wood. So now I know I can hit these hole marks and stop at the drill tape. Right there, same thing. You can tell when the tape is bottomed out because it pushes the uh, shavings out of the way. Whoa! That didn't go through, but that jumped. Oh, I have a, um, a hole here. Oh, that's the screw hole. Okay, no worries. I've done a test fit here to make sure these screws will go in, so now I'm going to shoot just a little bit of tight bond glue right there, a little bit right there, just enough to make sure there's a grip right here. Doesn't take much. All right, so now very carefully drop these into position. Feel these holes drop in. There it is, I could feel that now. That is centered, that's centered. I'm going to ease this in very gently, just to where the glue squeezes out a little bit. Same thing down here. That feels good. Good. A little bit of screws out there, that's great. Okay, so this is the moment of truth. Does it go in? Better set it roughly in place. I'm going to index the right one and the left one. Boom. Oh, 
yes, that is pretty darn snug. I'm very pleased with that. So thanks for sticking with me for this rather long video. I hope you picked up a few tips or just enjoyed the ride with me. It was certainly a bumpy ride for me and I, I had some nail biting moments throughout the process. But it's always interesting how, it, how these projects evolve. So if you have any thoughts or comments you'd like to share, please uh, drop me a note down below and give me a like or a subscribe. I'm going to be doing a lot more making of videos because Guy makes stuff. Mm -hmm.